I think we'll kick off now and um, let others join us, right? OK, as we uh, as we uh, do. Um, all of you are all very welcome to this National Academic Integrity Network webinar. It's a highlight in a series of webinars and activities marking National Academic Integrity Week here in Ireland. And it's my very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Zenith Riza Khan, who'll speak to us on the topic of first impressions, first year student concerns around academic integrity and how to alleviate them. A little bit of background. Uh, uh, Dr. Khan is a professor of cyber ethics at the Faculty of Engineering and Information Sciences at the University of Wollongong in Dubai, where she's been teaching since 2001. Uh, Zenith is the founding president of the Centre for Academic Integrity in the United Arab Emirates. And her research interests are in academic integrity, ethics in IT, teaching and learning, STEM for girls. And among many other awards, she was a recipient of the European Network for Academic Inte Integrity, ENII, Research Excellence Award in 2021. And of particular relevance to today's talk by Zenith is a role at the University of Wollongong in Dubai as program director for freshman pathway programs. In today's webinar, Zenith will outline evidence based findings on how students view their first year experience when transitioning uh, from schools and what that what might be done to assist them in that transition from second level to tertiary education. And just in terms of housekeeping, can I ask that you put your questions for Zenith in the chat and we'll take these at the end of Zenith's uh, talk. Zenith, I'm happy to give the floor to you at this point. Thank you so much, um, Billy. Once again, thank you so much for inviting me. It's such an honor to be here. Um, I'm quite excited to present um, the findings that we have and share what we have done from our position at the center and the university in the UAE to help this transition phase for students. I'm going to just quickly share my slides. I hope everybody's able to see them. OK, great. So um, as I mentioned, absolute pleasure to be here. Um, as Billy has mentioned, my topic is about first year student concerns, particularly around academic integrity and how, how to elevate them. Um, and that comes from evidence-based experiences from what we have done here. Uh, Billy's done a wonderful uh, job of introducing me, so I'm just going to skip that. Uh, so I'm hoping to be able to just quickly talk to you about first year university students um, dropping out academic integrity and first years and the concerns around that and then the way forward and some takeaways. Um, at this point, I'd also like to give a disclaimer that some a few of the slides that I have um, used here today have been used in some of my other conference uh, presentations before. So of course, first year of university is is so crucial to students adjustment and successful transition. And I think we know this as academics. We see the struggle that students have when they first enter university. And sometimes it isn't just about international students. It is about all students coming in because coming from K-12 schooling systems, uh, it's a huge leap. Uh, doesn't matter where most schools around the world are uh, you know, it, uh, the teachers in schools are so, um, uh, what's the right word maybe, you know, parenting, their attitude is so much more parenting than just teaching and facilitating, that they are guiding students, they are holding hands, they are helping students with, you know, understanding the concepts and doing their assignments and preparing for their board exams. And ultimately, even the counselors in schools are helping them with, you know, the career counselors are helping them with putting up the applications and things like that. And suddenly they come to university and, you know, that handholding is not there anymore, right? Um, doesn't matter for what, they have to be the ones to figure out, okay, I've been given a piece of paper, what does it say, where do I go, who do I talk to? So all of a sudden, they're expected to be independent, matured, responsible adults who are accountable for decisions that they're taking. So this first year of university pretty much determines the student's ability to actually persist and ultimately graduate from the degrees that they are um, you know, getting into. And I think that's what makes first year um, so, so crucial in a student's uh, learning journey. So before I go ahead with any more, maybe I will just ask um, the audience, um, what do these personalities have in common? So you've got uh, Steve Jobs at one end, you've got Steven Spielberg on the other, and you've got Tiger Woods in the middle. 
I'm going to try and see if I can see the chat. Okay. So anyone take a guess what's what's common in these personalities? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, they're successful, they're very rich, but of course they are all school dropouts. And I see somebody said they're all male. Yes, they are. Unfortunately, the only free photos, royalty free photos were of these gentlemen and not of the women who are also successful and um, college dropouts, but I did not get them as free, uh, royalty free photos. That's why I've not used them here. So this is it. And believe it or not, when we do speak to students, particularly freshman students, when they come in, when you're doing orientation and we are trying to tell them how important university life is, uh, you will get students telling you, yeah, but, you know, look at Mark Zuckerberg or look at Steve Jobs or look at Oprah Winfrey. You know, they were college dropouts and they're so successful. And they were, but they're not the you know norm they're more like the outliers right because studies have shown and continues consistently showing that you know in US, US especially about 24% of uh, first time first full time freshman students are dropping out of college right and that has actually hit more after covid uh, in the US it's 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 a lot better in ireland from what i have seen it's about 9% it was about 9% before covid and uk was about 5.3% now, these numbers don't seem very big, but if you look at it in the perspective of total number of students, then you realize how big a number each of these might actually be in terms of representing student population. Now, the problem is not everybody who drops out becomes successful like the people that we've just spoken about. The impact of dropout, and we've seen this over and over, included in, and of course covered in a lot of research, is that it means reduced annual wages, it means increased poverty, and it means reduced opportunities for uh, employment. Because a lot of companies out there, a lot of corporations, do want to see some kind of evidence that this person who's joining my uh, 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 you know, uh, organization has the capacity and the skills. And often the degree is that one, one of those ways of making sure that, yes, the person I'm hiring does have the required skill sets that I'm looking for. So definitely it is a huge impact if students are dropping out. And as you can see from the statistics, students tend to drop out more after the first year, within that first year of their university experience. So at this point, I would probably like to request um, Kiva to share the first link for Mentimeter. Um, and I would like to like ask the audience, why do you think students drop out within or after their first year in university? I'm sharing the Mentimeter uh, website. Kindly let me know if you guys can see it. Okay, perfect. So I'm trying to juggle the chat and, and what I'm sharing. So, okay, money, yeah, so finances, sure. Not prepared for it. They do feel um, extremely over overwhelmed. Unmet expectations, lack of belonging, peer pressure, demands. But there's again finances. Expectation versus reality, struggling with uh, academics, um, underprepared, motivation, disinterest, homesick, yes, failed exams, reprioritizing, wrong choices, transition difficult. Fantastic, yes. So everybody understands why students do drop out, right? Um, uh, statistically, statistically in literature, what we have found are these five main areas why students do drop out. So you've and you've picked it out. You've said money reasons or financial reasons, and that is a huge um, burden on students. Um, sometimes they are self-paying their way. Sometimes they're having to depend on um, loan student loans. Um, sometimes they're having to sell their property and you know get the money that they need to go to university. So it depends on geographically what are the reasons, but typically financial reason is number one. 
The next is the social life itself. Um, yeah, and you, again, a lot of you have said this, um, you know, feeling homesick, not being able to um, integrate with the culture of the university. It might be too different from their home country or their home city or the school's life that they have come from, right? And then adjusting and managing time with all the activities and extracurricular life that kind of goes hand in hand with university life. Lack of family support. And this was really surprising for us when we were looking and doing the study because um, we assumed uh, uh, when we started the study that this was probably going to be for a lot of the collectivist societies, but it wasn't true. Even students from individualistic societies um, uh, came back and said, yes, um, I miss my family. It's just as simple as that, right? They've grown up 12 years doing schooling with their parents or their family members right around them. And suddenly they were in a different country, uh, completely new language, new culture, and no family uh, to lean on. Um, academic vulnerabilities, uh, and again, some of you have already said that, from not being prepared in terms of the skills that they have brought from their school life to um, choosing the wrong options. And we see this a lot because I'm in computer science and engineering. Uh, some of the times I will see students tell me, yes, I've been told, I've been told to do this, right? And that's why I'm here taking this degree. Um, sometimes students say, I want to do that degree. You have it, but I'm not being allowed to take it because my parents think I need to be this person. So that could be a reason. Um, just could be just advice, sim some simple advice that nobody gave them uh, enough counseling in school to figure out what really they should be pursuing when they finish high school and go into tertiary. The other side of the vulnerability is, of course, their own cap academic capacities and whether they were, they're able to uh, you know, pick up and stay within the minimum standards required by universities. And finally, health reasons. Health reasons are everything from physical health to mental health to psychological health. Um, and all of that does have does factor in uh, when a student decides um, they are going to be dropping out. But of all of these, the one that we are focusing on is the academic vulnerability, because that is within the jurisdiction of what we can do as academics from our point, particularly from the Center for Academic Integrity in the UAE. So this brings me to the next Mentimeter, where I want to ask, what does an accessible and inclusive education mean to you? And you can use three words to describe this. Okay. Thank you, Keith. Okay, there we go. No assumptions. <laughs> okay, well supported. Realistic chance of success, correct collaboration, support, understandable positivity. All right, engagement, funding, okay, academic skills, alternate assessments. Oh, yes. Um, universal design, I like that. Welcoming, yes, of course. Freedom of speech, learner academic supports. Right, so all of this. And we do this and so much more from, you know, from our positions in universities, right? Because we are trying to make um, our education accessible and inclusive for all students that are walking into our campuses, into our classrooms. I mean, there is no question about that. This is what we do as academics. This is the first thing that we have in our mind that I want to be I want to be sure that all my students are successful um, when they're in my classroom as as management. Um, I want to be sure that all students have a successful learning uh, journey with us as a university campus. Right. But here's the thing, though. Um, because there has been such um, heavy focus on internationalization of education, we have seen higher education institutions focus more on imparting the concepts, values, knowledge in a more universally accepted um, manner rather than focusing on the national development with students going abroad. And again, like I mentioned, yes, during COVID, we've seen a stunting of that because of the travel restrictions and the border closings and things like that. But I think 2022 gave us uh, a huge... Uh, 
uh, wake up calls. Students are wanting to go abroad. Um, they want to pursue uh, education in different countries. Um, they want to, you know, have that ability to do capacity building, acquire desired degrees that are globally recognized. And this has hampered, of course, because of the visa processing and things like that. We have seen the ripple effect, but that's because of COVID. If, even if COVID was not there, we have seen this mobility of students, staff, and just general research across borders in the last past decade. And that that creates a paradigm shift because now we aren't just talking about students from our neighboring states or from the neighboring country. They are, we are talking about students who are coming from thousands of miles away, whose cultures, background, educational upbringing, everything is going to be 180 degrees different than what we are used to, right? So, but when you look at the definition of accessible and inclusive, it still says it's, it's something that allows students of all backgrounds to learn and grow side by side to the benefit of all. Right. In fact, um, I've put in the Council of Ontario University's um, uh, definition there because it says it's not just about allowing students because it's also about the process of designing courses, developing teaching styles that meet the needs of people from a variety of backgrounds, abilities and learning styles. So what we are effectively basically talking about is goal four of United Nations Sustainable Development, um, the 17 goals that they have, uh, which is quality education. But when we look at it, we say quality, we don't necessarily say academic integrity. And all our focus is on designing you know, curriculums, designing assessments, making sure students are understanding concepts, making sure our assessments, our instructions are clear. Uh, but a lot of the times we are not necessarily looking at what else is you know, hampering a student's ability to access the education that we are providing in a manner that is, you know, that is keeping them at an equal footing with everybody else in their classroom. And this is where we started looking at first years and academic integrity issues. And our study showed that first year students actually find themselves committing misconducts uh, because of lack of preparation for university studies, unaware of the large number of assignments that they're going to be facing and poor entrance levels sometimes that are also applied. But more importantly, what we did find was in most high schools worldwide, students are not taught the main concepts behind academic writing skills and academic integrity values. Academic integrity and should be equally considered, but it generally is not. Focus on supporting or even scaffolding academic writing skills of students without necessarily paying attention to the development of the values and the culture that goes with why we want them to follow um, the proper citations and you know, know how to develop references, why give acknowledgement instead of just teaching them referencing or citation. This led us to look at prior and content knowledge. Um, prior knowledge, of course, is basically when we are expecting students when they're moving from schools to higher education, they come with a certain set of you know, learning um, skills and knowledge that they're already coming with. And most of the time, this might be in areas like maths or, like I said, academic writing skills. Um, it, all of this is usually taken care of. This is something we look at, we understand, and we have, we do introduce introductory courses or remedial courses um, so that, you know, students are able to take those courses in their first year and they're able to, you know, manage their classes simultaneously. But there is a misalignment. And when this misalignment happens between the school curriculum and the content covered and courses taught in universities, students are struggling and they become confused. And in particular here, we talk about academic integrity. Right. Um, we have seen that although there are introductory developmental or remedial courses offered in first years in most universities across the world, very few actually prepare students um, on academic writing and integrity policy awarenesses. So the focus does seem to be on the writing skill itself sometimes, but not necessarily on why you need those skills and developing that deeper understanding, which ultimately would lead the student to have that culture of integrity within them, not just for my subject or first year, for the rest of their academic journey that they have with the university and beyond as socially responsible uh, you know, contributors to the society. 
Um, this is a really interesting quote from a study that was done um, by two authors in Thailand. And I put the entire quote because it really kind of captures what we are trying to say here. And this, what they found was a typical first year university student upon learning that a course forbids plagiarism would understand it to mean that the course merely expects use of a certain citation style or to review citation generators. But the student would not understand it to mean that the course expects honesty in placing one's ideas as a point within a greater line of ideas or that not citing invites punitive sanction. And both of those is really scary observations because this is the same that we have found in students here as well, um, whether it's from the university or from the Center for Academic Integrity, the UAE, where we've got a number of universities and schools that work with us. Um, talking to first year and freshman students, this is exactly what we have seen. Either they're not sure at all, but when they have been told about the academic writing process and etc., they don't necessarily understand the value behind why why I need to be citing people, why I need to give that acknowledgement, why I need to try and be original, right? That why is not being answered in a student's mind. From the Center for Academic Integrity, now I'll share two case studies that really kind of shook us and you know got us to kind of sit up and take notice. One was a student who came, who graduated from CB CBSC is an Indian syllabus, one of the Indian curriculum syllabuses, uh, graduated as a, you know one of the top students in that school, and then went on to join a university in Canada. Within the first semester, this student, who was a high achieving student, was pulled up to Senate hearing um, for plagiarism and ultimately wanted to drop out completely because they were so demotivated and disheartened. So when we spoke to this, um, the parent for this student, and we, you know, we ultimately we wanted to understand what was happening. The student came from a schooling system where rot learning is a lot, the focus of rot learning is a lot more than critical reflections, right? So this student was taught that you have to memorize um, and um, ultimately you have to, you know, put in the paragraph exactly as you have seen it. Um, looking more at CBSE curriculums, in fact, I do remember this conversation in 2016 with a panel of um, school counselors and with Tracy Bratag, um, the late Tracy Bratag and Teddy Fishman from USA. And the counselors had said that this is a problem because our syllabus is in our syllabus, the examiners, in fact, will check to see that you have got, written the paragraph word for word, including the commas and the explanations. And if you don't, you lose out on points. So when a student comes from that kind of a background, it's very difficult for them to suddenly understand acknowledgement, referencing, citation, paraphrasing. Um, why am I being now penalized for doing what I've been doing for 12 years, right? More than that is this, for instance, this particular word, the, you know, the Senate hearing was what really scared the student. And when we talk to students in generally about this, they said, you know, the, if you're outside of USA, for instance, the only time we hear the word Senate is when it has to do with politics in USA. So like, like the Senate House and all of that, right? So when they hear Senate hearing, this is a huge deal for them. It really creates this fear factor in them that's pushing them against continuing on with the education, um, the degree that they have actually enrolled for. The other case was very different from this one. It was a student from a UK national curriculum um, in the UAE um, who graduated from high school in the UAE and then joined a university in the UAE. First semester itself failed all four courses um, in first semester due to poor academic writing skills. Um, it was a non-STEM subject, so all the four subjects in their first trimester had a lot of essay writing and report writing and presentations, and suddenly the student was not sure because although they had come out of a UK national curriculum uh, school system, the school itself had not necessarily focused on teaching them about academic writing skills and et cetera, et cetera. And because they failed all four subjects, it was so demotivating that the student and the parents included decided this was just not for them. Maybe maybe it was the student and it was not something that they, you know, they could manage. So they were looking at alternate, like maybe doing a diploma or a small certification so the student could just go and then join the workforce, right? Um, 
both of these show very extreme systems, but at the same time, the conclusion was the same that they were both wanting to drop out of their first uh, within their first semester, not even first year, but first semester of the school uh, university because of their experiences. Our studies have shown that, in fact, international students are four times as likely in UK and five times as likely in USA to engage in misconduct behavior. Um, it's not because and um, and I would say this here again, it's not because necessarily they're international students and coming from particular geographic uh, locations. Um, many of you may have read this really interesting blog that came out from International Center for Academic Integrity earlier this year. It was a German student who had gone to USA and then kind of penned down um, his experience uh, of academic integrity facing these concepts of plagiarism and citations and review and things like that. So it isn't necessarily geographical location, but it is about the fact that it's students coming from somewhere else into your institution, uh, into your country from a completely different background. I think that's what this really should be highlighting here. Further, uh, furthermore, um, what we did find was we had done a pilot study of open access policies in the UAE for some some universities, and we saw such a vast uh, difference in the way the definitions, just something as simple as the definition of academic integrity was put forward. If you see the first one on the left, it says academic integrity is defined as honesty, trust, fairness, respect, responsibility, courage, no matter what the situation may be in an academic setting. That seems OK. The next one says upholding ethical standards in all aspects of academic work, including learning, teaching, research. So this is, this seems to be a lot more inclusive. Um, uh, you know, principles of honesty, fairness, trust, responsibility requires respect for knowledge, its development and academic integrity is foundational. And then it goes on more to name the stakeholders. The third one is what really is scary. The students will be penalized if they cheat in their exams and assignments. Cheating in exams will be considered when students try to copy from another student, bring in aid, not allowed. Cheating in assignments will be considered when students try to copy someone else's work or get help from outside. And this was their definition of academic integrity. So again, imagine students coming from high schools that don't necessarily have that background information about what academic integrity is. And then they come and face this kind of, um, you know, disparity in definitions, which, you know, so if they're in that third university, that is the definition that is being given to them, right, which is very punitive, very archaic, uh, you know, view of looking at what academic re integrity really is. The other issue that we saw, we had um, done a case study uh, and where we penned down the experience of one student coming from a very different uh, schooling system into their first year of university. And I've highlighted some of the words that really kind of show you the problem that you know that that we see students are facing constantly in their first year. Um, cheating or compromising your integrity was a self understood value. If that's how students see it, who, you know, where are they getting the guideline? I, that's what we would want to know. Who's telling them what that value is or means, right? If if they're if they think it is self understood, means they're learning from all their experiences all around them. That's not helping because if they're not in an educational setting where the school has focused on academic writing and academic integrity, they're not gonna be growing up with that understanding. Imagine a child whose parent does their project all through school life. They're growing up with the understanding that it's okay for someone to do my work and for me to submit it as my own. That's contract cheating right there, but nobody's thinking about that. So when we say self-understood, we need to take, sit up and take notice because if students think this is something that just inbuilt because you know I'm growing up with these values, who's really influencing how the student sees those values? The other two bubbles that I um, highlighted were judges, the society judges based on marks and related to scoring of marks in exams. So again, their thinking, learning and success is related to marks. If students are of the mentality that marks is it, and if in university, the first semester, teachers are talking about marks again, 
we are first of all reiterating what they know is right. And secondly, we are feeding into that concept of just you know very ex external uh, explicit uh, you know uh, motivation, which is very superficial, very surface level. And definitely, if it is surface level, it is not going to be uh, you know encouraging them to look at learning as something that is very internal, very intrinsic, something that is going to stay with them not just for their one year, two years, or three years of university, but but, you know, when they move into their next phase of their life, whatever that might be a second degree or a job or a career, etc. So what we realized was lack of accessibility to things like understanding of the values, prior knowledge, understanding of academic writing skills, of the policies and procedures within the campus, as support material and training can in fact hamper inclusivity, inclusivity of the students, which creates a barrier to what we consider to be quality education. So this is where I will quickly just share um, the couple of things that we have done from our space just to help uh, our first year students and freshman students that are coming in. Plus, at the same time, what we're doing with schools here so that it's not just about us and our university or our campus, it's about students everywhere. So um, even if they're graduating from a school in the UAE and going out somewhere, they've still got um, you know, a good amount of support system that they've got through the workshops and trainings that we have done. So we designed an intervention for schools. Um, we, of course, literature shows that, you know, intervention training workshops are very, very successful because students do sit up and take notice when we call it an intervention, a training workshop, not a subject or a course that they're doing. So the one that we did is called the Academic Integrity Values and Skills Workshop or IVAS. Um, this one we did, for, we developed it for our um, freshman students um, and now we've actually been requested to do it in other universities through the Center for Academic Integrity in the UAE and in fact it, for some 12th grade students who've already uh, on the verge of finishing their 12th grade and about to join university. So what we did was while developing this um, the workshop, we did it in four steps. The first step was the pre-training phase, then the training phase itself, the post-training phase, and then we looked at the outcomes and evaluations. So in the pre-training phase, we developed the objective for the workshop on what we really wanted to achieve because it's a workshop for freshman students. They're going through their you know, first year, so orientation. And during that time, we will do this so that Every new student who's coming in will sit in that um, session for 90 minutes and go through this particular workshop. So the objective was awareness of an improvement of personal qualities as students um, using the academic integrity values, exposure to quick, helpful tips on essay writing, citation and build, reference building. And the reason we say quick is because it's a 90 minute session. We didn't want to overwhelm them right at the beginning, but we want them to know enough that they take, sit up and go, OK, I need to now find out where the rest of this is going to be. Um, target audience, of course, were the first uh, new first year students, uh, duration 90 minutes. And other things that we included were also looked, looking at the university policies and procedures and the ex current exposure of students to academic writing and integrity. In the training itself, the, design, the content that we developed, we looked at overview of ethics and morality. So we actually were bringing in Kantian theory of a categorical imperative to saying end does not justify the mean, although usually that is what students say that, you know, if I have if I have to get the mark and, you know, the student teacher hasn't taught me enough, I am, you know, I'm of course, I'm going to look somewhere um, if I'm going to drive fast because I, I, you know, I need to get somewhere on time and I can't miss the meeting. I have to pick up my child. So everybody uses the end justifies the means. And that's why we bring in the theory to kind of counteract that and explain why that doesn't work. Um, then looking at honesty as basis for human relationships, uh, leading to the discussion on each of those academic integrity values, their importance in life, uh, class and life with examples. Then the behaviors that characterize misconduct and why, ultimately the superpower, which is the academic writing skills, citations and reference building. Um, and then we do uh, some activities, reflections, and in fact, we also do Kahoot quizzes with the students. 
So if we know, and we do, because usually during orientation, we will find out from our registrars uh, where most of the students are coming from. So we will have sample um, value sheets from their schools, prior schools, uh, put up on the slides, and then we will have that as a part of the discussion so that we can kind of refer back and say, hold on, you may think your school hasn't really taught you, and they probably haven't explicitly, but it was there implicitly in their core values, and here are the values. So we, we keep that conversation pretty much reflective and constantly critical because we want them to you know, take note and question everything that is being taught and spoken about in that workshop. After the training, we will um, give instructions to the teachers, the first year teachers who are actually teaching the subjects and who will get these students. We will tell them these are this is what we have done. This is the training that they have already got. Please go back and you know see if they need more. These are the other options that they've got um, that they can take back on academic writing. Um, simple things like words reference builder. Nobody talks about it, but we make sure students know about it. We have reminder sheets on academic interview values that are kind of, you know, sent out as messages or on social media posts for first year students. And then we, of course, we get we invite them to join the Center for Academic Integrity in the UAE as well. Um, these are just some screenshots of what these workshops look like. Um, and as you can see, students uh, really have a lot of fun when they're doing the 90 minute workshops. And I remember this one time pre COVID because it was face to face. Um, there was they were hooting and clapping and, you know, they were laughing. People from outside walked in to see what was really happening as part of the orientation because they couldn't believe people were enjoying an academic integrity workshop so much. Right. So th that's the idea as well when we are developing these workshops that we want to ensure that first year experience that students have starts right at the beginning with talking about academic integrity values and writing skills. As part of continued efforts, we do have series of academic writing workshops that uh, that happen every week for students so they can drop in. Um, uh, we do have somebody who's always there. If they want, they drop in and you know they can they can go back and talk to them. Plus, we've got services like Studio City that is, you know, that is there for students to access. Um, Beyond that, in order to ensure that the values are constantly you know, fresh in students' mind, we've got podcasts going on. We do research and publications with students, invite them to be uh, presenters in international conferences. Um, we invite students to be part of student committees and panels as ambassadors and champions. So we've got badging ceremonies that happen. They're taking oaths and all of those. So it's quite exciting for students because it's something that's happening constantly throughout the year. Uh, they have come back and worked with you know, school students and university students from other campuses in the UAE to do, you know, pledge uh, pledge parties. Uh, they've done, they've made movies. They've done panel discussions, webinars, both locally and internationally as well. We have a triage clinic where if a student has an allegation, um, uh, you know, that is going on for them, they're welcome to come to the clinic and speak to us and the counselor so that we can help them and guide them. Because at the end of the day, especially with first year students, they, a majority of the time it is unintentional and it's not malicious. But if we tell them, oh, that's it, you know, you, you've done this, this is a slap in the wrist, here, is, here you go, this is your penalty. We're scaring them. We are, of course, we have to do detection and penalty, but we can also make sure there's a way back for these students. And we've seen we've seen the triage uh, have tremendous success, particularly with first year students, because even if if it's a small thing where you know they didn't know and they, they copied and pasted and they didn't know because we're using Turnitin, so it's showing up. So you know it's a way for them to come back and we are you know dispelling all the fear about Turnitin and that it's an educative thing. You know this is how you use it. Look at what has happened. You know what does that mean? It you know it's color coded. It's telling you. Where you've copied from. So first they vent. Um, when they cool down, then they are ready to listen, and that's when the real learning is happening with these students. And this has reduced re repeat offending because once they learn, they know, and they're not going to be doing it again because they're not intending to do it. Um, it and it was, you know, it, the, the the intention behind their uh, allegation was not malicious. Um, what you saw in the small video there was a student doing a presentation in a colloquium. So we do a lot of these co conversations constantly on campus. We had we have a working wall on academic integrity. We launched a website on academic integrity. So these are all continued efforts that students 
we want to ensure that students are constantly in touch with once they've done that orientation with us. Going beyond, um, this is what we have done with um, the workshops for schools as well, because schools wanted it. But then we realized it wasn't enough to just do 90 minute um, sessions with schools because we are not going to have them constantly in our university. They're probably going to other universities and we wanted to help them given the case studies we've seen from the center. So what we did then was we did this de designed what is called the integrity um, spring camp. Uh, which target school students aim is to be a next level preparedness course and the length is nine hours. So we used the uh, Butcher Davis and Heighton guidelines to kind of develop this module. And this is what the module really looks like. So the first day we look at academic integrity, values, pathway careers. Why is this important when they join university? And that first year, what does that mean? What are they going to be looking for? Training on academic writing in more details, in more depth. Um, you know, with workshops on citations and referencing. Ultimately, there's a competition where, you know, they're ref write, doing reflective writing uh, without invigilation. And then, of course, they have the uh, cascading model as ambassadors. So they become ambassadors and then they go and start doing workshops in their own schools and wherever they're going next. So this this camp has really seen a lot of success um, uh, that uh, in the three years, three time, three iterations that we have done it, uh, we have had so far 14 uh, local schools in the UE that have participated, two international schools that have participated uh, with an annual growth rate of 4.35 percentage. Um, uh, 400 teachers have attended the training. Uh, schools from four different curricula have sent in their school uh, students for these uh, workshops. Uh, we've had 350 parents joining. Um, particularly once they knew there was the spring camp and then we did the IWAS workshops, they were also joining the IWAS workshops with us. This led to uh, 12 panel forums, discussions, uh, 90 work uh, students joining for particular workshops, 18 teachers and faculties attending unique webinars, um, and so on and so forth. I'm going to go through all of those details, but this camp especially has really led to a greater conversation about first year experience of students and why it's important, so important to have that conversation about academic integrity values and writing. So as a final takeaway, because I know I'm almost um, uh, at the point where we need to open up for question answers, is that we have to accept the vital role first year experience plays in students learning journey in universities. We need to recognize that there is a gap in prior knowledge for students joining university in their first year, not just in you know, concept subjects, but also in academic integrity and writing values. It's not a given that just because you're a student, you would know these skills or you'd understand the values. It's like saying, um, you know, of course I'm telling my, my child not to lie. Of course we do. Who tells their child go and lie to a teacher or go lie somewhere? None, no parent will ever teach that value to their child. But if I'm picking up the phone in front of my child and going, oh, I'm sick today, I can't come to work. And then I put the phone down and I start watching a cricket match. That's telling this my child that it's OK to lie. So, you know, so accepting that these values are not being taught explicitly, but they need to be. We need to include students as co-creators um, in conceptualizing and organizing these campaigns, workshops and training because students speak student language. I wish we did, but we don't, right? So we need to have students as uh, partners in this in this um, campaign so that you know we're able to help more first year students and we need to go up and down the supply chain. So it's not just current students who are coming in, but also high school students and ultimately students who are graduating that we want to look at so that we can have a continued you know, lifelong learning, as, as they say, to support not just the senior students, but also school students. Um, these are some of the resources that I have referred to, uh, but I'm happy to provide um, all the whole list if anybody's interested. Uh, with that, I come to the end of my presentation and happy to open up the floor for any questions. Thank you. Uh, Zina, thank you so much for that. Um, this has been uh, really interesting and really exciting. I'm very much taken, right, okay, by some of the stuff you're talking at the end, right, okay, about going up and down the supply chain because uh, institutions, I think, have become increasingly conscious of the need, right, okay, to uh, talk to their senior students, right, so, so, to, so to continue that message. 
But I love the idea of actually going down the supply chain, right? OK, and working with high school students, right? And, and exposing them to the kinds of considerations to which they will be challenged in uh, when they when they get to um, uh, to uh, uh, third level to to university. Um, I want to take you back. Uh, there's a there's a particular question in the chat, right? OK, yeah. uh, that uh, started you, you. You talked about the way that the scaffolding falls away or even in some kinds disappears when students move from high school right okay, to uh, to university. And in some sense, the point you made about uh, putting out accessibility, it wasn't just about access, but it's also about design and delivery. And that prompted, I think, uh, Michelle Tour to ask the question, do we need to think about first year in a different way? Do we need to think about uh, different staff student ratios, more support for learning activities? But the key thing she she talks about slowly, slowly removing the scaffolds, right? OK, of, of changing it so that it's, it's less of a cliff edge, but more, yes. right? OK, a gentle slope down. Yes, um, absolutely. Thank you so much for that uh, feedback and the question. Um, we do believe that we need to uh, move away from this sudden change that comes into a student's life, right? And what we have done, for instance, from the universities, we st we do we start spring camps for students who are putting in their admissions to our university. So we invite them to attend camps. Uh, one week camps in the in the degrees that they have actually registered for. So while they're still studying, they're coming to the university and they're engaging for a week with different you know, different teachers, different labs, different exercises, um, and they get to see how what a university life looks like. Right. So the, again, the purpose is that we want to make this a smoother transition for students. Um, that's just overall, but particularly for academic integrity, for sure, these spring camps that we have been doing, uh, we've seen a lot of students sit up and say, hey, you know, um, they've come back to us and said, because we started this in 2019 and we've had a few students who've already graduated, gone to universities and they're coming back to UAE to visit parents and they're coming and say, hey, you know, thank you so much for that, because you know, this really helped me when I was in the university and I was one of the very few in new students who knew what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. And they were really surprised because, you know, other students coming in had no clue about academic integrity and policies. And, you know, we had to look up the policy and read it up and find out what the, you know, what it meant and what the you know penalties were and things like that. So definitely, I think it's a it's a it's a huge jump for students. Um, again, like I said, irrespective of the geogra geographical location, I think it's it's about going from that schooling system mentality to a university system mentality. But I think first years as a whole, I think we need to have that mindset change, um, have the most experienced teachers taking those classes, not the least experienced teachers taking the classes, because these are first year students who who need that little bit more guidance than the rest of the university does, because Till now, it is a cliff, you know, it's a cliff jump that's happening. And there's there's a related uh, question in in the chat as well, Zina, about uh, assessment in first years, and and in some sense the the sense of whether or not grading and whatever creates pressures on students, right? Okay, in first year, and um, it's mentioned, right? Okay, the concept of of not grading in first year. Yeah, um, that's an excellent um, uh, question. In fact, yes, you're right. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with exactly what you, what you said and what we have found with students that it's marks, right? It's that mentality of marks, right? Because that's what's driven them for 12 years. When they come to first year, uh, we are once again talking about grading assessments and suddenly in each subject, they've got like two, three assessments and they've got an exam and maybe they've even got a midterm exam. Right. So there's a lot of over assessment sometimes that's happening, particularly in first years. And what we have tried to do from our position is go back and review subjects to see, do you even need an exam? Let's let's have that discussion. You know, does your subject really need an exam or can the student just do a presentation of some kind of a reflective work and show you what they've understood? So subjects like where we do academic skills, English language writing and things like that, we don't have exams anymore. Right? And now we're looking at even business studies, some of the business study subjects um, where we don't think they need they need to they need to do an exam to get to test their understanding of the concepts. So we need to definitely uh, reach out and check subjects 
because lecturers work in bubbles, right? As lecturer, I remember when I was just a lecturer and I, I only used to think about my subject, right? Not beyond that, because at the end of the day, of course, it's workload. Um, so when as a lecturer, when I'm thinking of my subject, I'm like, OK, I need to make sure students have understood all the learning. You know, they're hitting all the learning outcomes, so I need to test them for A, B, C, D, E. So how do I test them? Let me do a midterm. Let me do three quizzes. Let me have one assignment. That's already four or five things that I'm assessing from one subject. Right. So sometimes lecturers need that guidance to go back and say, hi, let's take a step back and see what are you really trying to assess here? And let's go back and have that discussion about what really can be done in order to assess that what you've identified rather than having four, five, ten assessments. Thanks. Zina. There's a there's a question in the chat uh, which really bears on on your training workshops and the extent to which they are. First of all, are they mandatory for for first year students, and are they embedded in any other module or are they standalone? Okay. So the workshops that we have designed, we design them as part of the orientation week that happens. It actually, orientation happens over three weeks in our university. So it's a part of that orientation where it is mandatory for students to attend, whether it is online or face to face. And we give them the option. You can either join us online or you can be on campus and you can join us. Um, this online concept, of course, happened after COVID because now we know we can do it. Um, so it is mandatory. Um, it is it happens right at the beginning of the student's career, but we do refreshers every year for students. So we invite students back. That is not mandatory. The refresher courses are invitation by invitation. We give them, we tell them, please come and attend. Um, and a lot of students do come back. They do walk in through those doors for those refreshers as well. But more importantly, even the workshops that happen day, weekly, those see a lot more um, interaction and uh, engagement from students throughout their uh, career beyond the first year. And uh, seeing it in one sense, what the training workshops are doing is they're approaching it from, if you wish, a, a preventative perspective. Uh, are you and your team involved in any sense on the other side of it, on the disciplinary processes? And are your team part of the panels making decisions, right? OK, about misconduct cases. Right, so um, I I was the academic integrity officer for my faculty for three years, and now we have uh, moved to um, launch the academic integrity committee, uh, which is basically going to be getting all the cases. So we are at that transition phase where we are going to uh, launch the uh, thing when the, when that committee comes into place. I'll be the chair for that. But as of right now, um, the cases that we get will go to the disciplinary committee because we are we are a small campus. We are 3000 students. So um, up until two years ago, everything the concept was, yes, we have one disciplinary committee that has two branches looking at general misconduct and looking at academic misconducts. So um, as part of the academic integrity, um, as an academic integrity officer, I would be called in um, to sometimes weigh in on decisions as well. So yes, I have been involved. And uh, there's a question in the chat too about, do you run comparable schemes for taught postgraduate students that yes. are new to the university? Yes. In fact, we have postgraduate students who were ambassadors in undergraduate who have taken this uh, this thing on forward, and they are the ones who do the workshops for, for postgraduates. So it's not even us doing the workshops. It's students, our own students, graduates from undergraduate who are champions, who have gone through the process, who have done the workshops, who have gone through the training, and now they are the ones who are training academic, uh, the postgraduate students. And in fact, um, postgraduate students are a lot more receptive because they, I think, they understand immediately the importance of what's being told to them. Right, so they, they do they're a lot more engaged um, throughout the semesters rather than undergraduate undergraduates. We have to do a little bit of chasing, but postgraduates are very in tune. Yeah, and um, you you talked in it about uh, the importance, right? Okay, is of students as co-creators of workshops yes. and training. Do you use undergraduate senior undergraduate students in the workshops? Yes, we. Uh, so originally when it launched, of course, I was doing a lot of it myself. 
slowly um, we built the Center for Academic Integrity and now we've got the student board and every university that has a representation in the center has students from their campuses in that student board. So these students are the ones who are actually now effectively designing and running workshops and campaigns on campuses. So now when we do the orientation for students in our campus, for instance, I will probably come and do the introduction and talk a little bit, and then we will have the students coming in, the senior students coming in, and then they're running the rest of the workshops. And uh, this is as much an observation for us here in Ireland or whatever, but John Burr Murphy in the chat, chat asked, should academic integrity concepts be embedded in the second level curriculum? And uh, it, he goes on to say, is that a conversation between the the regulator here with our Department of Education? Has, has that kind of issue, right, OK, arisen, right, OK, in UAE? Sorry, what is second level? In, in, in terms of uh, high school, sorry. Ah, OK, right, so different terminologies. Yeah. Yes, so a lot of the study that we have been doing has actually been focusing on schools and not just high schools. In fact, even primary schools. Right, um, because the example that I gave you of a child who does a science project, right? Obviously, the school needs to be educated because sometimes the school is telling a six year old go and make a desert model, right? Uh, it's a, a six year old doesn't know what a desert model is. So obviously the parent or the nanny or some kind of a guardian is going to be coming together and building that project for the student. And then the student does show and tell in school, takes that project and goes, here is my project. So, you know, it's not just high school. The values need to be taught explicitly from primary school itself. Uh, we are pushing, um, we have now developed um, a pre-service and in-service teacher training for school teachers so that, you know, we can start, we need to start somewhere. So that's where we are started. So we are hoping for that curriculum to come through. And once that does, then we will put it as um, as, a, as a proposal to, to the, um, the, the regulatory body in Dubai and to the universities that are actually offering masters in education uh, subject, you know, degrees for school teachers. So we are we are at that point where we are having that discussion. Everybody knows it's important, but um, this is it's still very much informal. Uh, thank you, Zina. Zina, we're coming to the end now. Thank you so much. Um, I'm conscious there's, there's, there's a comment in in the in the chat about uh, a common conflation between academic integrity, which is really about the positive things, honesty, ethical behaviour, etc. And then on the other hand, plagiarism, which is just an example of misconduct. Right. And the challenge of uh, how do you explain that to students that that looking for help from Chegg or Course Hero or whatever on their assignments is wrong? So here I think what we first need to do is ask them why they're looking for help. Once you figure out why they're looking for help, then you can answer that question better. And a lot of the time students will come and tell you because I didn't understand the question. Yeah. And I didn't know who to go to. So if that's the problem, that's an easy solution. You see, so yeah. it's very important that we actually go and ask the students first. Why are you using? Why are you looking at Chegg or Course Hero? Right. Um, sometimes, yes, students are saying because, you know, they need that extra help in your side there. You know, they need that extra support or whatever. We've got Studio City. So we are, give, we are first trying to figure out what is it they're doing and why. And generally it is if they have maliciously decided that this is what they're going to do. Obviously, that's like a very small percentage of students. Then it's very difficult to change their mind. Mm. But majority of students, if you explain to them that, look, you're looking for help, but look at what this site does. You know, you are having to upload something which is copyrighted by the university in order to get an answer. That is just like getting an answer from a friend or from somewhere else, from a book. Why do you think it is any different when it is Course Hero or Check? Mm. Right? So when we explain it like this, they do understand that, yes, there is a difference. And then when you show them the actual website and what all they have and what all they're doing, that's when students understand the gravity of these websites and what they really mean and what they stand for. Zenith, thank you very much. We're now at the end of our allocated hour. Thank you so much, Right OK, for all that you, all the thoughts, Right OK, you've given us, the inspiration, Right OK, that you've given us, Right, uh, in terms of how we might think about dealing with this aspect, Right, of the challenges uh, to academic integrity that we see for our first year students. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute honor and pleasure, and I do hope it has helped uh, your audience. Thank you. Bye.